You are listening to the Gateway Church in Spring Lake, Michigan. To learn more, visit us at thegatewaygh.com. We're in a series, the second week of the series, called My Big Mouth. And the power of what we're talking about over these few weeks, uh, are, it's, it's kind of a deep work. And I understand we're going to talk about two different things today, and we'll get there in a second. I understand that um, this is not necessarily easy stuff, and you know it can be personal, and it may not be the most exciting material to be like shouting the pastor down, so to speak. But if you want to try, you can, because it helps. And I, I did see one pastor, he said, uh, the, the more you talk back, the faster we'll get to lunch. And, uh, and people were like, amen, brother. <laughs> and uh, I'm not promising that, though. So anyway. <laughs> but how many of us, seriously, have ever put our foot in our mouth and you wish you had a pause button or a rewind button in your life? Oh, yeah. All right. All right. I'm talking to the right crowd. Well, we're going to wrestle with this. And I think that the growth that's going to come out of this series is not going to happen necessarily in the pews here, but it's going to happen outside of these four walls when we are reminded by the Holy Spirit to hold our tongue and to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And we'll get there in a second. We started with a premise in Proverbs chapter uh, chapter 18, verse 21, that said that life and death is in the power of the tongue. Look what that verse says. The tongue has the power, say with me, of life and death. There's a power within us. Words over the history of mankind have changed the course of nations, has started and ended wars. I mentioned last week that it's made men rich and women famous. There's power within our words. And we really honed in on a verse in James chapter 1, verse 19, that said we need to be quick to listen and, say it with me, slow to speak. I'm glad you came back. We all need this, don't we? (laughs) It's slow to speak. And this is really the anchor idea that's going to carry through uh, for us. And it's easy to remember, hard to apply. How many would agree? And so we gave you a rubber band, and we gave you a rubber band as you're coming in. Let me see your rubber bands if you got them on. And the idea here is that with the Holy Spirit's help, that he will help us to be quick to listen, slow to speak. And when our big mouth gets us in trouble, we just give ourselves a little snap. Now, I don't know about you, but this last week, the Holy Spirit was really working overtime in my life. I broke two rubber bands. I'm leading the way. No, no. And I, it, it's kind of sad. Now, there were a few times I didn't have to snap myself because the Holy Spirit was revealing. I'm saying, mm, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> and it was good. But then there was the one time, Thursday night, not pretty. Jessica's parents were over. Mom and Dad, I'm so sorry to put you through this. Jessica was there. We had some of the staff over. And I could almost, it was like an out-of-body experience. I don't believe in those, but it was kind of like I was looking in at myself, and my mouth wouldn't stop talking. And I just, I mean, it was painful. I'm not going to tell you what I said or what I did. But I I went back and apologized and um, had a nice talk with my daughter in particular. But anyway, but it's like, oh, Lord, help us with our big mouth. And I hope that we're going to do some things, and that God's going to make some difference. And I'm looking at some sharp people. I can see, I mean, I see it in your eyes. I would look at you and say, you guys are advanced. And so we're going to take another step today. Are you ready for another step? All right, good. It's part of the human condition, right? We're going to address two areas today. And even Christ followers, if you're a Christ follower, this is going to apply to you. Uh, Two areas that get our big mouths in trouble and And before I reveal it, I want to remind us that it's my big mouth. It's not your neighbor's or your husband's or your co-worker's or your boss or whatever. It's your big mouth we're talking about. So as we look at these two areas in particular, don't be thinking of anyone else. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you with your big mouth. Now, some people will look at these two things that we're about to reveal, and it's almost like they treat them like 
hmm, these are like spiritual gifts. Like these are things that the Lord just helps me with, and it's not the case. In fact, it's not helpful at all, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. No one likes these two areas, but we all fall victim to the two realities of complaining and criticism. Complaining and criticism. Two different ideas, but they are tied together, aren't they, church? They feed off of each other. When one is present, the other is right there in the wings. Let me try to explain. When we talk about complaining, I'm talking about people that whine and complain, that they're not content with something and they make their discontentment known. They often are self-centered. They use harsh words and there's this wave of negativity. There's a lack of being grateful when you're complaining and it wears people out. On the criticism side, it's like this. They're nitpicking or often sarcastic, often unkind or cruel. Again, a wave of negativity. And I'm not talking about constructive criticism. We'll, we'll address that briefly at the end of the sermon. I'm talking about kind of a negative, tongue lashing, a criticism. And that criticism leads to complaining. And then complaining leads to being critical. And both are life-sucking. They drain people around us. And one pastor said, I was reading this week, I was reading about complainers and criticizers this one pastor, I won't tell you who it is, he said every church has at least one rude, critical church lady. And I thought, I can't believe they said that. And then he said, if you strike that woman down, two will pop up in his place. And I thought, I'm glad I didn't say that. Complaining. When we blame, I know who you, I mean, maybe you're thinking of someone, not here, right? What happens when you are critical or you're complaining? What happens is that you pretend to have some insight. And in spiritual realms, it's like a spiritual insight. Like, oh, yeah, the Holy Spirit, and then you're just critical. Or you're super wisdom, and you offer that when no one was asking. The truth is, critical people think that they are like an expert in an area, oftentimes. Oftentimes, though, the reality is that they're insecure, often petty, and it's ugly. Isn't it? I was talking with Bobby in the office about this on Thursday afternoon, and I was just sharing with him kind of the direction I was going for the week, and and I said, man, I found, I found some resource that said, man, when people are critical, when people are complaining, it's often from an insecure place. He said, yeah, that's true. And then he said, well, what about the narcissist, the person that thinks they're all that and more? Because often they will criticize as well. And I thought, man, that's great. So whether you're insecure or you're so full of yourself, it can help, it can move you to criticism or to complaining. Complaint in the Old Testament, the greatest example is the children of God, which is hard to say, but it's true. And the children of God, they're often selfish. And what's interesting is when they were exposed in their complaining, what it says in the Bible, that they took their eyes off God. When you take your eyes off God, then you become critical or you will complain. And it's a real problem. It is not a spiritual gift. Again, it's insecurity or negativity. Have you ever met a person that's critical and said, hmm, I'd like to be like them? No. Or you find someone that's really is good at complaining and you're saying, man, I'd like to be like that person. <laughs> I mean, that's not, I mean, we're giggling. We're, we're, it's like, no. You don't want to emulate that. The wisdom in the scripture says to stay away from that. Stay away from people like that. Stay away from people like Proverbs 21 says. Turn there with me, Proverbs 21, and I'll just warn the guys that are here. If you're sitting next to a lady, just keep your arms down and your eyes forward when I read this verse. It says in scripture, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome or nagging wife. Good job, guys. The ladies are chuckling. 
Better to live in a dry, arid, there's no food, no shade, no, no, no anything. It's hot than to live with someone that complains or is criticizing. And I was telling Pastor Bobby that I was going to use that verse. And, and he said, hey, that was a father speaking to his son, giving him that advice. The flip could happen, no doubt. Ladies, you could say the same thing. You'd better, it'd be better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome or a nagging man. Isn't that the truth? No one likes that. We've got to watch ourselves. And in Galatians chapter 5, I want you to turn there with me. Uh, whether you're a Christ follower or not, this morning we're going to look at this. In Galatians 5 verse 14, it says, The entire law is fulfilled in this keeping of this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. You know this to be true. We want this to be true in our own lives. And even, like I said, if, even if you're not a Christ follower and you're just you know, kind of hanging around, it, you're just living, you're breathing air, the human nature is like, yes, we should love each other. We should care for one another. The golden rule, do it to others as you'd have them do unto you. And then the next verse is very insightful. It says, if you bite or devour each other. In other words, if you're complaining or if you're critical, there's definitely application there. It says, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. The truth of that cannot be understated. Everyone knows this. And if you put complaining and criticizing in there, it will destroy the intimacy of your marriage if you're not careful. It will drive a wedge between you and your kids as you're raising your kids. And what's even worse, it will keep you from sharing the gospel in your workplace because no one wants to hear about the gospel from someone that's a complainer or that's critical. Isn't that the truth? Lord, help us. If your words are harsh, if they're biting, you will be destroyed. When you're self-absorbed, when you take your eyes off God, you need to heed the word in verse 15. And the inverse is, po is very powerful. The opposite is true, that when we get closer to God, what happens? When we're in his presence, we're in his word daily, we're maybe worshiping at home, or we're here worshiping, we're filling our life with godliness, what happens? We become more aware of our sinful nature, don't we? <laughs> the truth is, we, we say, all right, we've got this sinfulness, but then what happens is then we see the grace of God all the more. So we're getting close to God. We have the sinful part. There's grace, right? And that should lead us to be less complaining and less critical about the speck in our neighbor's eye when we've got a plank in our own. Isn't that the truth? I hope you see that. So if no one wants to emulate a critical or a complaining person, and you understand that it's hard to maybe see it in, even in your own life, we know the golden rule, why do our big mouths get us in trouble? Let's wrestle with that for a moment. Let's go back to James chapter 1, verse 19. It says that to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Well, James doesn't stop there. In James chapter 3, we see this discourse about the tongue, the single most sustained discussion in the New Testament uh, on the use of the tongue. It's interesting, this past Monday and Tuesday, if you listen to the radio and listen to Focus on the Family, two days in a row there was a guest on there that wrote a book called Keep It Shut and was talking about the power of words. And I'm like, oh, God, you're complimenting what's happening happening on Sunday. And the, the lady, Karen Eman, she, she did a personal study of all the times that the tongue or the mouth or speaking or speech in general or how talking affects relationships. There were over 3,500 times in Scripture about this. And we see in James chapter 3 a great discourse. Turn with me there and we'll start in verse number 2. In verse number two, it says this, we all stumble in many ways. That's a great verse, a great section of the verse. I love how practical and how honest James is with the church. He's saying, look, we all make 
mistakes. And then he goes on and says, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. And then he goes on and gives us three illustrations. The first one is in regard to a horse. He says, when we put a bit in the mouth of the horse to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. How many have ever been horseback riding? Just show of hands. All right, a few of you. All right, excellent. And when you put that bit in the mouth, it controls a huge, giant animal. And then in verse 4, it says, that, or take a ship as an example. Although they are so, they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Look at this ship, this huge ship kind of representing maybe uh, what... That's a pretty nice ship. But anyway, the rudder, the idea is so small compared to the size of the ship. In both of these cases, there's a disproportionate power. Everyone say that with me. Disproportionate power. And when you run the idea of complaining and criticalness into these verses, think about the power of our tongue. Then he goes on. He says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, makes great boasts. That's verse 5. And it says, Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the, body, of the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. We don't even need a, really a picture. You've seen on the news what the devastation in California, the forest fires and the, that just have ravished hundreds and thousands of acres and how devastating. And all of that started with one spark. It's, it's crazy. And we see not only the disproportionate power with these little things doing big things, but here we see the potential destruction of our tongue. Put criticism and complaining through that filter. We can destroy others when we're critical and when we complain. Put those three up together. I want you just to look at this for a second and maybe pick one of those images that really sticks out. Something this week that you can kind of look back to. Is it the first two, the disproportionate power of something so small to do so, such great things or you know, big things? Or is it the little small spark, the potential danger? And then run that through the filter in your life of your complaining, maybe your criticalness. And then let's look at verse number 7. Verse number 7 continues. He says, all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and, the, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. And you think of animals, right? You think of dogs and cats and maybe elephants and, you know, and, and camels and horses and even guinea pigs that can be tamed by humans. Right? How many have ever had a pet and you tame it, right? With birds, the same thing is true. Cockatiels and parrots and macaws and other birds you can train. And I had this revelation. Maybe the Bible has an error because it says even reptiles can be tamed by mankind. And I'm thinking, no. No one likes reptiles. Maybe it's just me. I did a little Google search. And there's actually something called a blue-tongued skink. You can look it up. That can be tamed. And there's actually a lot that's written about this. PH or Pet MD. Pet MD. It's a website I didn't ever know that it even existed. It says that one of the articles is, "Can your reptile bond with you?" I'm saying no. <laughs> we kill reptiles. We chop snakes' heads off. We spray poison so reptiles stay away. And if you like reptiles, I'm sorry for that illustration. But I'm saying, no, there might be an error. I don't know. But God said it's true. So even these things can be tamed. But look at verse 8, the point. It answers the question why our tongues, our big mouths get us in trouble. Look what it says. It says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. The fact is, no one can tame it. You think, man, James, thanks for the encouraging word, right? Like, come on. 
And then he goes on, verse 9, and he goes on, he says, with the tongue we praise the Lord with, and our Father. And with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, right? My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Then it says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same stream? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or can a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt, a salt spring produce fresh water. And then you're like, okay, what's next? Like, where's the answer? What do we do about this? And there's nothing. Nothing. I've read this particular passage probably hundreds of times, literally. When I first was a kid, or first called to ministry when I was 11 or 12 years old, and I felt God wanted me to be a pastor, youth pastor, I thought for sure at that time. My youth pastor said, well, I want you to preach. And this was the passage, James 3, that I preached from. I studied Pastor Bruce, and I was excited. I prayed a lot. I got some insight from some other people. Some people were helping me. And I thought, my, my pastor said, you got 20 minutes. And I stood up there with my notes, and I preached my little heart. I thought revival was going to happen. And, uh, and five minutes later, I had nothing else to say. <laughs> now, I know what some of you are thinking. Can't we go back to the old days? <laughs> no. I'm <laughs> sorry. I got more to say. I don't know. But the truth is I've studied this. And in every time I read this, James gives no solution. I'm thinking, what in the world? He leaves us hanging. There's no takeaway, just bad news that our tongues are evil. I'm thinking, man, but church, that is no excuse for your bad behavior with your mouth. Because the Bible in its entirety does help us with what to do with our tongue. And I want to look at a section of scripture, Ephesians chapter 4. We have God's word, and I believe it's going to spread some light, speak some light into this discussion. Ephesians chapter 4, this is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. And if anyone had the right to complain or the right to be critical, the apostle Paul I mean, you look at his life and all the craziness that happened, all the setbacks. He ends up in Rome late in his life, and that was his number one desire was to get to Rome, and he's in prison. Come on. And over and over, he's beaten and bruised and dragged out and just all kinds of negativity. And if anyone had the right to be critical or complain, it was him. But he says, in regards to our tongue, verse 29, he says, Do not let any unwholesome Talk come out of our mouths. But only what is helpful for building up others according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. I was reading that this week, and I'm thinking to myself, that sounds nice. It's kind of soft. It kind of sounds Christian. Maybe unproductive and unrealistic. Like no unwholesome talk, right? Like how do we get things done, <laughs> right? There's got to be some critical or some complaining somewhere, no? He says, no, we should speak what's helpful. And then in verse 30 he says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you have sealed for the day of redemption. The idea I saw in my mind was that, look, we are God's children, and he's looking on us, and he's giving us some instruction in his word. He's saying, look, no unwholesome talk out of your tongues, out of your mouths. And then he sits back and he watches us, kind of like we do with our own kids. And how many times we watch our kids, and we see them do or say something, and you're like, ooh, that's going to hurt. That's going to leave a mark, right? And you're saying, man, I wish I could, right? Don't, oh, don't say that, but they do. I can almost see God in his heavenly throne, looking at some of us. And all of a sudden we get angry or we start complaining or we get critical. And God's like, oh, oh, oh that's going to leave a mark. Don't, don't say that. Don't do that. It's not going to go well. Verse 31 gets to the heart of it. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. That's where we ended the service last week. It was a, it's a heart issue, right? 
and we need the Holy Spirit's help. That's where the root cause is, is what's happening inside. And then Paul gives the anecdote. Look what he says in verse 32. He says, be kind and be compassionate. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. He says, you need to forgive. And if anyone was asking, well, how much do I need to forgive? He gives the answer, just as Christ forgave you. Unlimited. It's this forgiveness. It's this covering. It's Christ's example that would teach us to be quick to listen and slow, slow, slow to speak. And I get it. It's easier to find fault. It's easier to look at what's wrong instead of what's right, isn't it? And I was thinking, well, who in the New Testament really described someone that was critical or complained a lot? Can you think of a group of people that kind of did that? Who? The Israelites, that's Old Testament. New Testament, the Pharisees. That's what I was thinking. And I was thinking the Pharisees, they're always like down and, and negative and, and all these things. And then I thought, well, wait a second. It's not the Pharisees that we're like when we're critical or we're complaining. We're actually more like the devil himself. Because what does the Bible say? The devil is the accuser. He's the one finding fault and pointing it out in our lives. He's the one that gets us to complain or gets us to be critical. He's the one that fills us up with pride or puts us down so bad that we're insecure. And the anecdote is, again, to get close to God so that we can see our own sinful nature, right, be magnified the grace of God in our life, saying, God, I, I'm so sinful, but God, your grace is so amazing. And when we accept the grace of God, then we are not going to be so critical about the speck in our neighbor's eye when we've got the log in our own. Lord, help us. The verse I just mentioned a few minutes ago, Matthew 12, 34 the idea is that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. It says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And if you're speaking complaints or if you're critical, you got to know it starts here. It's a heart issue. And the Lord, I believe, is going to help us in this season to really get our minds around what does that mean and to help us make good decisions to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, we got a couple minutes here. There's a couple takeaways that I was just making note of that this might help you kind of get your mind around this idea in your life where you might uh, could you know where you could see some improvement. And there's one thing that I think that I want to start with is kind of talking to yourself, saying you would want to say this to yourself: I am not going to criticize anyone or anything that I don't understand. This is important. We talked about it a little bit last week, looking at things through the proper lenses, right? That we always look through things from our own age bracket or our own socioeconomic status or our own upbringing or whatever the case might be. And we got to be careful that we are not criticizing something we don't understand. The second thing is that we have to know that words are not equally weighted. And when we come to being critical or complaining, the power of your words are different with neighbors or in your workplace or with a friend or within the home. Do you understand that? You can say to a neighbor passing by, you know, you know something negative, and they may not even recognize it. You say the same thing at work and it carries a little more weight or in your neighborhood or certainly in your home and the power of our words at home cannot be underestimated. The third takeaway is this idea that there is no place for sarcasm in family. This is important. When you're raising your kids or within your marriage, there's no place for sarcasm because it wounds. 
Listen, kids can be destroyed by your sarcastic words. The volatility never goes away. It's true. Dads, and I really feel like this may be for someone, your sarcasm doesn't build anything but resentment. It does not make your son or daughter tougher. It just makes them tougher to connect with when you are sarcastic. I have written in my notes, knock it off. There's no place for sarcasm in family. The next idea is that we want to wow people to life, not how people to death. This is the type of person you want to be. Bobby and I were talking about this. Uh, I think Andy Stanley said uh, it was kind of known for this idea that, that when someone gives an idea, instead of be like, well, how is that going to happen? You know, you know, what, you know what's gonna ha- what is it going to take to do that? Instead of howling it to death. And so a great idea, you're like, you walk away like, I wish I'd have never had an idea ever in my life. Right? I mean, you can how something to death. Instead, you can wow it to life. Be like, wow, all right. Let's see, what can we do? Or, you know, you put things together. And, and so you wow things to life, not how things to death. And the last little takeaway is never offer criticism. Instead, only when you're asked, you can then give constructive criticism. And there's a difference here. Because when you give constructive criticism, you're not just saying everything that's wrong or negative. You need to also bring a solution, a potential idea, and there's a difference. So don't be critical. And by the way, if you're offering criticism and you're doing that consistently, it's a sign that you might be critical. (laughs) And just one more thing. If you complain or criticize once, it's like, okay, you recognize something. There's always things, you know, and sometimes it's in your mouth or in your head and you don't say it, but sometimes you even say it. If, if you say it once, it's like, okay, there's a pass. You're like, okay, I recognize that and that didn't go so good or you're critical or whatever. But if you repeat it more than once, let's say you say it two or three times, you might have a problem. Church, we are called to be like Christ, to be full of love. And there's no place to complain or to be critical. So let me ask you this. Where do you have work to do in regards to these areas? In regards to your big mouth, where do you have work to do? And let me ask you maybe even a more interesting question, a follow-up. Let's put that up there. Who hopes that you get to work soon. (laughs) Seriously. In regards to being critical and complaining, where do you need to work? And who is hoping? And my guess is it's probably someone that's close to you. Isn't it the people that are closest to us that get the brunt of our verbal tongue lashings? I know it's true in our home. One last thought, and then we're going to wrap this up. Social media. 10 years ago, 20 years for sure ago, we never would have be adding the idea of social media in a sermon like this. But the truth is, some of the things that we say online comes across critical, we complain. And it feels good to vent sometimes, right? You share a post. Maybe you didn't write it, but you kind of like it. And there's this anonymity. Why do I want to even say that? Anonymity. I can't, I can't say it. I messed it up first or two. You know what I'm talking about, right? You think no one will really catch it. But the truth is, it is shocking how often people will say things that are critical or they complain about themselves, about their friends, about their family, and let's be honest, about politics. And you never say those things in person. Stop it. We are to be known by our love. Christ is our example. 
And Lord, help us. And again, like I said, the growth here is not going to happen just in these few moments. The growth is when we leave here and we, with the Holy Spirit's help, can be reminded to be quick to listen, slow to speak. And in regards to being critical, in regards to being a complainer, we may see some snaps this week. But what will help is if we change our perspective. The song we sang at the end of the worship set this morning is It Is Well. And it's really about us looking at things through a different lens, through a different perspective. That when we learn to look at things through God's perspective, it helps us. And so what I'd like you to do is to stand and we're going to enjoy and worship together this final song and then we'll close things up. And what I'd like you to do is to sing this song. It's remarkable. With the idea of being critical or complaining. And some of the words, some of the phrases, they popped out to me when I was studying. And first service, as I was worshiping at the end, it just popped out. So through those lenses of being critical or complaining, let's worship the Lord together. part of the song that talks about my eyes being on you, Lord. Through it all, my eyes are on you. It reminds me of the Old Testament, right? When the children of Israel complained, what was the issue? They took their eyes off God. It's so important. This morning, as we leave here, let's ask the Holy Spirit to remind us Let's not let our big mouths diminish our witness or tear down or be destructive in any way. There's power in our words. This morning, one last thing before we go. I want to just address those that may have found yourself here at the Gateway Church that don't have a relationship with Jesus. If you don't know the as your personal Lord and Savior. Don't walk out of here without making that commitment. The Bible is really clear. It just says that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. It's kind of like what James was saying. We've all stumbled in many ways. No one has to acknowledge that. I mean, it just is the truth. We all know that in our heart. But then the Bible also explains that the gift of God the gift of God. It's Jesus dying on the cross, taking your sin and my sin, and he offers us what we call salvation. He saves us from our sin. And what is, what is he saving us from? He's saving us from an eternal damnation. Because the Bible also says if there's even one sin that goes unforgiven, we won't be able to get to heaven. There's no sin in heaven. You say, how do I get to heaven? Well, you get to heaven by putting your trust in Jesus. He's the one that has taken our sin. And when he died on the cross, the blood that was shed for him, it covers your sin. And this morning, there are some that are here that need your sin. to accept Christ and for your sin to be erased so that when Jesus looks at you, he looks at you as perfection. You say, no, you don't know my story. What the things I've done wrong, it doesn't matter. We've all sinned and he can cover you with his blood. If you're here this morning, you're saying, man, I need that. I want you just to slip up your hand right where you are. If you need Jesus to forgive you of your sin, just slip it up. I'm going to pray with you. Yep, we got a hand right over here. Who else? Second service. Saying, yeah, that's where I am. Just put up your hand so I can see it. I want to pray with you. Walk with you. Is it just the one this morning? Anyone else or this afternoon? Anyone else? Just slip up your hand. For the sake of the one, I'm 
just going to ask that you would repeat a prayer after me. We call it the sinner's prayer. It's not the prayer that saves us, but it's believing the words. And so let's say this together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me. Please forgive me for all my sins. For all my sins. Come into my life. Come into my life. Make my heart clean. Make my heart clean. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe you died on the cross. And your blood was shed. And your blood was shed. For me. For me. Help me to live for you. Help me to live for you. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. And it says in the Bible that the angels in heaven rejoice. And so let's rejoice when even one thumb comes back or is found. What was lost is now found. We, we celebrate. We celebrate. And we'll follow up here in just a moment. Praise the Lord. And that'll be great. All right. Now the assignment is to go from here. And if you choose to wear the rubber band, let the Holy Spirit use this silly tool to remind us. And when our big mouth gets us in trouble, give yourself a little snap and help and let, help and let the Holy Spirit help you to grow in this area. Amen? Amen. Lord God, will before us, behind us, and all around us, we pray this in your wonderful name. And all God's people said a, amen and amen. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. And come and greet Pastor Bruce and Brittany. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegatewaygh.com.